brilliant. Um, I'm going to start with a word of, I'm going to call it a word of warning. Um, we have not rehearsed. All, all of the acts have practiced and they are fantastic, let me assure you of that. But um, this will not be completely polished. And it does also mean we would appreciate as much support as possible from each and every person here. So I, I promise all my performers that you would be like the nicest, most welcoming, friendly uh, audience they've ever had the joy of performing in front of. So, you know, you can blame me for this. We have a lot to live up to from what we've told them. Um, so we have a whole host of various uh, acts, as, as the name suggests. It is a maths variety show. Uh, everyone here performing is a mathematician, um, but they will be doing a very, very wide range of, of different things. Um, and yeah, that's about it, really, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> the clues in there, it's a maths variety show. Um, so I'm going to be comparing the whole thing and sort of introducing each act uh, and sort of possibly talking a little bit about some of my mathematical tattoos uh, in between the acts as they set uh, everything up. Um, I thought I would start with a little bit of a story actually, um, which is to, and also give you a bit of an introduction to my research and, and what I actually do when I'm not um, playing around on YouTube. Um, and that is research in global mechanics. So my PhD project uh, was looking at the outflow of river water into the ocean. Um, we were trying to sort of figure out what's happening there um, with lots of applications in terms of pollution and understanding where pollution goes in the ocean and also in relation to climate models. Um, and as part of the project, I got to go on a ship and sail around Antarctica for six weeks uh, in the Southern Ocean. Now we go to the Southern Ocean because it's the most remote ocean on the planet, um, so it has the least impact from humans. And it's also really important to study the oceans when you're looking at climate change because the ocean responds on a much slower time scale than the atmosphere, for example. So if things start going wrong in the ocean, then we're really screwed, in short. Um, so we went to the, the Southern Ocean, and I've got a little video here. Um, so this is me wearing um, a GoPro camera on my head, wandering around the ship. I was actually calling this to my parents. They wanted a tour of the ship that I was on. So you can thank them for this. Um, you'll notice a giant storm cloud, uh, not that side there. I haven't noticed this in the video. You'll, you'll see the point when I realise there's a giant storm heading towards the ship. Um, but I was on the ship for six weeks. And um, for the data we wanted, you kind of needed the ocean to be really well mixed. So this means we actually were purposefully chasing down storms, which made for lots of very interesting conversations with the ship captain, who obviously did not want to chase down storms. So this one was the first force and lever that hit. If anyone knows anything about sailing, it goes up to 12 on the scale. Um, 12 is like the apocalypse, considering I've been through two 11s and they were felt like the apocalypse. Um, so this is the first force of lever. I think I now realise, you can see me starting to run a little bit. Um, but the second one was the really bad one, because the second one hit when we had two weeks left at sea. So you think, imagine this, you've been stuck on a ship, we didn't make land for four whole weeks, and you're trapped with like 20 strangers when you started. Really nice people, but you know, it's, it's, it's quite, it's, yeah, <laughs> anyway, you can imagine the situation. So you end up drinking a lot, right? We had a bar on board, you could go and it's like an honesty bar, you could take a drink, and you just like left, you know, put a little tally mark next to your name with the drink you had. And when the second Force 11 hit, the fridge containing all of our glass bottles fell over, and all of the beer bottles smashed. So our like one escape of being stuck on this ship, with two weeks left to go, was a route there. Um, we did have some spirits left. I remember drinking brandy and lemonade. Do not recommend. Uh, <laughs> so we managed to drink all of the alcohol with a week to go. And obviously everyone was a bit down. And we had this uh, guy on board. Uh, his name was Chris. Probably shouldn't have told you his name. But it was Chris. And um, he, he was pretty resourceful, let's say. He used to be in the army. And um, he sort of grabs me to one side and goes, Tom, what am I doing? We can, I know how to fix this like alcohol shortage on, on board the ship. Uh, so we went down to the, the chemistry lab on board and we distilled industrial strength ethanol, uh, mixed it with two parts water and two parts orange juice, and made the best 
fuck a screwdriver I've ever had in my life. Like, I've never been so drunk, and I've never had less of a hangover because this stuff is pure industrial grade, like no impurities whatsoever. Um, and we also had to, because this stuff's so controlled, because it's pure ethanol, pure alcohol, you have to like sign a book to say what you were using it for. And obviously we only realised this once we were drunk, so we literally wrote signed stuff. <laughs> uh, but no one came back and shouted us, so we got away with it. But that was how we got through the final week, was being the creative scientists that we are, we, we actually distilled our own, our own alcohol. Um, right, so that's enough from me for now. I'm going to introduce our first act. Um, so, everyone you're going to see today is a student. Apart from David. <laughs> um, so, so, David is a professional performer, and he is totally available for bookings. That will not be the first time you will hear me say this. Um, but he's, he's fantastic, and, you know, it's obviously been quite hard for all of us who do live performances over the last year and a half to, to actually do any live performances. So this is David's big welcome back, uh, and hopefully he's going to get you all lively, excited, and, you know, full of energy for what's to come. So um, please give a round of applause for David Hall. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear? Give me the thumbs up if you can hear me. Give us a wave if you can hear. Oh, right at the back. Yes. Brilliant to be in Oxford. Oh, yes. Yeah, I teach. Yeah, oh, never mind, all right, I won't do that. Uh, I'm David, yes, and I, uh, I do the show. And the show is called? Math Magic. It's called what? Math Magic. Yes, Math Magic. And, and I mean, it's a bit of a misnomer, because actually there's, there's no magic in it at all, but there's, it's a bit of maths. And the thing is, maths itself is magical. And that's what I try and get across in, in my show, wherever I might be doing it in a festival, in a school, whatever. I mean, I mean, look around you, there's all sorts of things. Yeah, maths, of course, is not just about numbers, is it? I mean, there's all sorts of things in maths, very useful, you know, keeping score and, 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 and money, of course, but it's also about other things like shapes. Did you see that amazing sculpture outside? Go and check out the sculpture. And these windows, look at them from the outside. They're actually rectangular, arched, and pointy. I mean, it's ridiculous. Anyway, so I thought, just to uh, warm you up, we'll do something about shapes. Here's a shape in this uh, pen pot. What shape's that? Almost? Cylinder. It's a what? Cylinder. Cylinder. Yeah, it's very good, very good. And uh, what other shapes? Yes, what shape's this piece of paper? Rectangle. 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 Did you know if you divide that by that, you get root two? It's two, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, and here's, here's another shape. And this shape is called a... Uh, it's a what? <laughs> this one on the front, the black one. Arrow. It's an arrow, and of course it's on a card, which is shaped like a square. square. And in fact, it's got an arrow on one side pointing up, an arrow on the other side pointing down. It's one pointing up, one pointing down, one pointing up, one pointing down. And if you turn the side, of course, one points this way, one points that way, one points this way, one points that way. Turn to the bottom, one points down, and the other one points... Oh. No, down. They both point down. Yeah, look, pay attention. I'll show you again. Arrow on one side pointing up, arrow on the other side, sudden hush falling, hasn't it? Like, what? Yes, arrow on one side, yeah. arrow on side pointing up, and arrow on the other side pointing down. Right? It is one point out, one point out, one point out, one point out. Point aside, one point that way, one point that way, opposite directions, there. And you turn to the bottom course, one point down, and the other one points. Down. No, up! <laughs> Can you mathematicians say? Right, focus hard. One arm points up, the other one points down. One points up, one points down, one points up, one points down. Put it aside, one points this way, one points that way, one points this way, one points that way. And there's, of course, the young man over there blowing the kiss, blowing the kiss here, you see him, and there, and, he, and now, it always points to him because he's like that. <laughs> see? Yeah. How does it work? Who's spotting it? How does it work? Anyone know? Anyone know? How does it work? Yes, what do you think? It's the kind of the corners you're holding. Give that man a round of applause! Fantastic! <laughs> The other day he was in the school, it took about 20 minutes to get the answer. He's absolutely right. It depends which corners I'm holding, you see. Of course, I, always, I spin it around. And maths is the word for spinning around. What's that called? It begins with a ro ro rotation. Can you say that? You have to rotate this hand and say that. Say that. Rotation. Yeah, and again. Rotation. Yeah. That teach you how to glass of wine before you come in. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's rotation. If I hold these two corners and I uh, rotate it around this. Um, uh, what do you call the line between two, uh, two corners there? Diagonally. Diagonally. Yeah. Hands up, we've heard of diagonally. Yes, yeah, go no, yeah, That's right, which is where Harry Potter buys his brooms, isn't it? Yeah. If you hold these two corners 
and you'll rotate it around this diagonal. The arrow's always point in opposite direction. It doesn't matter which way you start, they always whoops, the arrows point in opposite uh, directions. Uh, you rotate around these corners, but if you hold this corner and this corner and you rotate it around this, of course the arrows always point the same way. It doesn't matter where you start. Now you can make yourself one of these, go out and about in Oxford tomorrow and earn yourself an absolute fortune into, you know, betting people they can't work out which way you need, where you need to go. All you need is a square of card with an arrow on one side pointing up and an arrow on the other side pointing... Right. Oh, right. Yes, that's right. Sideways, exactly. All right, all right. Give a round of applause. Round of applause. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, so Tom said he wanted me to get your brains warmed up, and I hope they're getting a little bit warmed up. And of course, one of the great ways of warming up your brains is do a bit of mental maths. Who likes doing mental maths here? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a, that's already about 90% more than ever in any of my audiences. Yes, mental mass is great, So here's some numbers, we're just going to add them up, all right? So, uh, what number's that? Thousand. It's a what? Thousand. It's a thousand, yeah, use your hands. What number's that? Thousand. thousand, yeah. A thousand plus 20 is? Thousand. Plus 30 is? Thousand. Plus a thousand is? Thousand. Plus 1,030 is? Three thousand eighty plus uh, one thousand is four thousand eighty plus twenty is brilliant. Give yourselves a round of applause. Fantastic. Mental majesty. Thank you, thank you. Hands up. Who said five thousand? Who said five thousand? Yeah, look at that. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah. You said what? Two thousand one hundred. It's what? Four thousand one hundred. So, <coughs> what was your name, man? Michelle. Michelle. Yeah. There's always one, isn't there? Yeah. The trouble is, there's always one. Well, what you say is what? 4,100. 4,100? Oh, dear. Let's do it again, just for Michelle, right? Now, concentrate, Michelle, please. <laughs> what number's that? 1,000. Plus 20 years! 1,000. Plus 30 years! 1,000. Plus 1,000 years! 2,000. 2,000. 1,030. 3,080. Plus 1,000. 4,080. Plus 20. Hang on a minute. What's 80 plus 20? 100. So 4,080 plus 20 is 5,000. That's all it is. What is it? 4,000. 4, Give a round of applause. Brilliant. Very good. And as I say, you stood well done, Michelle. You stood up yourself there. You knew you, knew you were right. And no matter what I said and how much we love, you stood up for yourself. Go. Give a round of applause. Fantastic. What's right and what you believe in. So there we are. And uh, I remember doing that years ago in a big, big, big secondary school. And uh, the teacher, um, the, they had the head of, of maths, real brain, this amazing woman. And we got to the end, a bit like Tom on the internet the other day, and he went, oh no! <laughs> and she got it wrong. But people do, it's great. I just want to finish with a little, uh, a, a little uh, quiz just to get yourself going. A quick question, you just know about this. Um, this is a, 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 a sort of logistic problem. So a hunter is hunting for bears, right? Hunter's hunting for bears, and one day, she comes out of her tent, hands up and thought it was a man. Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. One day they come out of their tent and uh, they're looking for bears. And there's, 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 there's no bears around. So they go, why they go? A hundred yards due south, no bears. So they spin round most of the degrees, they go a hundred yards due west, still no bears. Suddenly there's a great roar, and this huge bear comes bounding towards them, <laughs> and then a flurry, they spin round right a hundred yards due north again and dive into their tent for safety. And the question is, what colour was the bear? White. <laughs> <laughs> White! <laughs> Come on, tell them why. Uh, you went 100 south and then 100 east and 100 north, so, and you got back to where you were. And the only place you can do that is the North Pole. Round of applause! <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, 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 the end of the triangle, of course, is not always 180 degrees, it depends, uh, and many people think that the Earth is, uh, is not actually flat. No, no, no. <laughs> I declare the show open. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, David. And once again, David is available for school boxes. <laughs> no, brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, always good to start the show with energy. And, you know, there's one thing David's got, it's definitely energy. Um, right, so we have many, many musical numbers for you throughout this evening. Uh, and keeping us off with the first one is, is the lovely Neve. Round of applause, Neve! So I thought I would talk to you guys a little bit about what music actually is, right? So what's the physics of math about music? Um, of course, everything is math, so of course music is also math. So I'm just going to grab this whiteboard down the connection. <laughs> Thank you so much. Let me just use assessment, everyone. Cool, okay, so first thing to ask you guys, what actually is sound? What's that? Wait. Wait, right. So sound is actually just a transfer of energy. So all we're looking at is uh, how are we moving my voice to you guys as a transfer of energy from one place to another. And as the way that that happens is it moves as a transverse wave, right? So sound coming from me over to you guys is just going to look something like this. Um, so in order to kind of explain what, how all this kind of music stuff works, I'm just going to give you a few properties of the wave. So first thing is a length of a wave, right? So the length of a wave is whenever it repeats itself, so maybe from a peak to a peak, right? So we call this guy the lambda. And we also have the speed of the wave, right? How long does it take to go from A to B? Uh, and that's just going to be C, so we'll write that that is the speed. It's some terrible hardware if you will. Um, but the really important property that I want to talk to you guys about is um, frequency. So the frequency of a wave is um, how many cycles, how many on one of these wavelengths pass a point per second, okay? Um, so there's a really interesting, well, important distinction we should have between speed and frequency of a wave, right? Because if I want to say, okay, I want my wave to go from here to here, how fast does it do it? Say it's got a really big wavelength, right? A really big wavelength and it goes like this, and that's fine. That's about from A to B relatively quickly. But say I make my wavelength really small now, I've got a tiny little wavelength like this, then I'm going to have to have a really fast frequency to get it there in the time, in the same time that I had for this one. And frequency is the reason that things sound high or low to us. If we've got a really high frequency, if we've got a wave oscillating really quickly, then notes going to sound really high. Similarly, if it's low, low frequency, it's going to sound low to us. So that guy is going to be called F, all right? And this is measured in something called Hertz. Okay, so turns out this is a really easy, nice relation between these three properties. So we have a little equation here called C equals F lambda. Um, and because the speed of sound is constant, right, it's about 340 meters per second, give or take, then we have something called an inverse relationship between these guys, which is a really important property in physics. So that just means that if I increase the frequency, then the, um, then the wavelength is going to decrease by the same factor, or vice versa. Okay, so that's the first little bit. Um, another really important thing I want to talk to you guys about is fundamental frequency. Can I have a show of hands? Who has heard of fundamental frequency? Okay, quite a few people then. Okay, you guys have played this screen. Um, so the fundamental frequency, it turns out actually everything has this, but essentially it's the first mode of vibration. So the way I'll show you this is we're going to just visualize a, um, a guitar string. Okay, so if I plug the string in a guitar, well, we kind of visualize it vibrating up and down in this really nice, like, semi-circular shape, right? So if we've got our guitar string from here to here, then our first mode of frequency is this really nice looking thing like this. Okay, and this is what it looks like when something vibrates with its fundamental frequency. So let's call it fundamental frequency F0, okay? Um, and then going back to what our wavelength was, if this is lambda, then this guy is just going to be the length of the string. The length of the string is equal to lambda over 2. So lambda here is equal to 2L. Okay, fine. Um, but let's say now that I put my finger in the middle of the string and I plug either side instead. Then we're going to get the second one of vibration. And it's going to look a little bit like this. So we're going to get a guy looking like this and something else coming over looking like this. And um, if we look here, this, this guy is going to be actually the length of lambda, so we have that L is equal to lambda here, 
And because we had the lambda is equal to L here, is equal to L here, and so you have this inverse relationship that I was talking about before, then this is going to be, and the frequency of this vibration is going to be 2 by the fundamental frequency. Okay, so enough physics talk. This goes on and on and on and on to infinity, essentially, which is basically what we kind of have up here. This is called the harmonic series. Um, and it turns out that whenever we hear any note in music, it actually doesn't just vibrate at the fundamental frequency, so the one that we perceive. So, for example, COP today is about like 440 hertz, and that's what we hear. But all of these other modes of vibrations are also happening simultaneously, all the way up to infinity. Um, and the reason we only hear the one that the fundamental frequency is because it's a bigger amplitude, so it's a little bit louder. Um, but also, we have a threshold of hearing, we can only hear up to a certain amount of frequency, so we don't, we don't hear them all. But this is actually the reason that different sounds and different notes sound really nice together. So I'm going to try and convince you that that is actually true. Um, so we call this the harmonic series, okay? So I have a note, that's, so say we've got C here, that's the bottom note, so it's fundamental frequency, and all these other guys are on the other frequencies coming above it, so the 2F, 3F, 4F, all the way up. Um, so a, a really nice combination of notes is a, a major third, so it's just it's just three notes above it, it sounds really good to us. We have it all the time, um, in all the pop music, there'll always be people singing in this combination of notes. Um, so the major third for uh, C is actually D. So if you look here in the um, harmonic series, we've got lots of Cs popping up, but we also have a couple of Es. And there's a lot more that, as, as you go up this harmonic series, you'll see loads and loads and loads of Es. So basically, the reason that these things sound nice together is because we can play an E on top of each other, and because there's so many in its harmonic series, we really like the way it sounds. So if we look at it in an E harmonic series, look at all these alignment, there's so many E's coming up, but it repeats itself over and over, and that's why things sound nice. Equally, if we have something that sounds like it flashes to our ear, it's because the harmonic series doesn't have notes that, doesn't have the notes in its harmonic series, and it clashes to our ear. Um, another reason we like the way things sound nice together is because um, of the ratio of the frequencies that we're hearing. So our math, our ear is doing math whenever we're listening to music, essentially. So we like things to sound um, simple. So for example, um, an octave, uh, which is just you know, one note to a higher version of that note, is a two to one frequency. We also have a perfect fifth, which is a three to two. So I'll demonstrate for you um, an, an octave um, scale. So say if I play for you, um, a C major scale that I'll play an octave, it sounds really nice to us, and I'll show you that now. So we like that, right? Because it's two to one frequency. We have that really nice ratio of frequencies, and we go like, yeah, okay, I like that. That math is easy, that math makes sense. So I'm going to say that sounds nice. <laughs> And then we also have something called a, like a really common interval music, is something called a, a perfect fifth, okay? So I'll play you a perfect fifth, and it's the start, it's the start of so many, so many songs, okay? So I'm going to play it for you, and I want someone to try and think of where the rest of that song should go, or a song that starts like this, and see if you can think of one. You'll be kicking yourself if you don't. <laughs> So why does an A on a piano sound different to an A on a saxophone or an A on a violin? Um, and it's because the harmonics that come above it are more emphasized in different instruments, essentially. Um, so a saxophone, for example, is an example of what is a pipe closed at one end. Right? Here's our open end of pipe, here's our closed end. Um, and basically that means that we can only have odd harmonics present. Um, very easy to show this, but I won't bore you with that right now, but we get it. Maximum amplitude here, we get a minimum one here, and we can only get odd harmonics. So that's why the saxophones sound similar to clarinets and sound similar to oboes, because they all only can have odd harmonics. 
similarly, flutes and tin whistles, they're open pipes, and they sound different as well. But my favourite thing about the saxophone... So, the saxophone is, um, the real how it works, I've got this little reed here, right? This is actually just a tiny little piece of wood, well technically grass, because it's actually bamboo. So when I blow into it, this guy vibrates, and then this, this reverb throughout the whole saxophone, you get that sound. Um, but the reason the saxophone is really, really fun to do jazz in is because my guitar string, so this reed essentially, I can change it at will. So I can move my mouth up and down the reed and I can change it. So if I change the length, I change the wavelength, I change the frequency. So we can bend notes and we can do really fun jazzy sounds that you can't do in other instruments, like a piano for example, where you play the note and then something bangs in the string and it stays that way. And you don't get to bend the notes in this fun way. Not that you can't do jazz piano also, but <laughs> saxophone's a little bit more fun to do. So um, I'll give you a little like doodle on the saxophone now. Um, nothing very special, um, just to demonstrate that it's fun to play jazz on the saxophone. And I hope you guys can hear the overtones and all the fun harmonies that um, are coming next. tattoos on my arm. Not that I need a second excuse to do that, but you know, I was actually asked to do that. Um, so um, there's just one that, that you need to be aware of, um, and this is on my right arm over here. So what we've got here, uh, up at the top, is a string of numbers. So it's 120 digits wrapped around my arm in this spiral. Um, and it's the number E, named after Euler, if any of you have studied A-level maths, you will come across this number. Uh, if you haven't studied A-level maths, you will have no idea what I'm talking about. So this number is 2.718281828, etc, etc, etc. It is a really important number in calculus, and it appears very naturally in any situation where you're modeling growth and growth rates. Um, so you see this occurring in, in nature in terms of like growth rates of plants, flowers. My favourite example is actually um, with compound interest. 
So you have this, this sort of puzzle, and I'll, I'll whiz through this, but normally I do this a bit slower, where you say to someone, I'll give you the option of having three pounds right now, or you can have one pound, and I'll give you one twelfth of the interest every month for a year. Or you can have one pound, and I'll give you one 365th interest, so less interest, but you get this every day. So you know, you're getting it every single day you get interest. Or you can have like one 33.6 millionth interest every second across a year. And what you spot if you calculate these numbers is as you increase the frequency at which you're being paid the interest, you get close, you get more and more money. But the limit, the maximum you can possibly get through this is this number E. It's two pounds and eighty-nine pence. So the whole point is you really should be taking the three pounds right in the first place. So anyway, that's a very, very, very fast introduction to number E. It's my favourite number, uh, and I believe it's going to play a role in, in our next act. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Joshua, who is going to do a stand-up routine for you all. So round of applause for Joshua. Then. an area of maths called graph theory. Now, it might not be the kind of graph we're used to with two axes and a function. This is a kind of graph where we've got points, which we call nodes, and we've got lines, which we call edges. Yes, this is the edgy part of maths. <laughs> There's actually a problem in graph theory. So that's the friendship problem. It says, prove that if G is a finite graph in which any two vertices have precisely one common neighbor known as vertex, which is adjacent to all other vertices. Of course, the real friendship problem is if you study graph theory, how do you make any friends? <laughs> <laughs> Last year, we had to choose options in our degree. I decided to take a module called representation theory. I thought that would be easy because there's hardly any representation in maths. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do political jokes as well. <laughs> so that's the end of the political section. <laughs> it wasn't easy, by the way. It was quite hard. Uh, during representation theory, I came across a result known as Shaw's Lemon, named after a mathematician called Shaw. I don't know about you, but I think Shaw's a pretty name to have as a mathematician. Imagine the confidence with which he could lie to his colleagues. I've solved the Riemann hypothesis. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk to you about a mathematician called Joseph Fourier, who is a French mathematician who is famous for developing an area of maths called Fourier series. He worked on it for a year. Anyway, that's enough of him. <laughs> um, I want to talk to you about a physicist called Michael Faraday. Uh, he uh, contributed to the field of electromagnetism. It didn't take him as long as Fourier. 
He worked on it for a day. I want to talk to you about a mathematician called Pierre de Fermat. You may recognise him from his famous Fermat's last theorem. He claimed to get a proof of it, but that the margin was too small to contain a proof. I suspect this was nonsense, and he just made it up. Fermat, aerial game. <laughs> <laughs> Moving swiftly on. He likes average jokes. Yes. No need to be mean. <laughs> The mean, of course, is calculated by taking the sum of all your data points, xi. That symbol just means add up, and then you divide by the total number n. Of course, the letter x is arbitrary. I prefer, personally, to use the letter y, so I use yi, but then people think I'm from Newcastle. <laughs> so good at interpreting exponential data? Because they know how to logarithm? <laughs> Did you hear about the tragic tale of the computer scientist who got trapped in his own code? It was very sad. He was in bits. <laughs> <laughs> Maths exam questions where you have to draw your own diagram are getting really out of hand these days. I mean, where do you draw the line? <laughs> I was asked, actually asked to do this problem the other day that I personally think asked a bit too much for me. I, I solved equation after equation, and at last I had an answer that it was staring at me arrogantly from the calculator. And then the question said, please give your answer to three significant figures. I thought, come on, more work, seriously? Anyway, I went to the post office and I posted it to the Queen, the Prime Minister, and the President of the US. <laughs> Try only three figures more than it knows. <laughs> um, lots of people know Tom, the host. Uh, he's well known for all his mathematical tattoos. What a lot of you won't know is that one time he got um, a bit of an argument with his tattoo artist. They actually had a physical fight. Yeah, they really did a number on his arm. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, that's exactly what Tom wanted him to do. Really playing into his hands. <coughs> um, this joke is the mode. <laughs> well done. You were very clever. Um, I was talking to this French mathematician, and we were really getting it off. It was getting quite late. Oh, and aside, by the way, um, who's, who's done maths at uni? Right, all you, all you need to know for this joke is that Koshi is a mathematician. End of caveat. Um, <laughs> she said, Voulez-vous Koshi avec moi? I was like, oui. So we went back to hers and did some contour intervals. <laughs> we had a great time. <laughs> Lots of people say French language of love. I disagree. It's maths. I've not been testing this theory on Tinder. Here's an excerpt from a conversation I had recently. I opened the classic. I work out. Like equations and stuff. <laughs> I said, want to see my abs? Four. <laughs> some really well defined apps. <laughs> uh, no reply. I, worried, I was worried I was losing her, so I went, went in with the cock curve has an infinite length. <laughs> now I can see some of you looking at me, thinking, Joshua, that's lewd, disgusting, and physically impossible. <laughs> well, get your minds out of the gutter, that's a direct quote from Wikipedia. <laughs> 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 Still no reply. Uh, and then a year later, I was feeling a bit lonely. I thought maybe she was a graph theorist. <laughs> um, what, what's a statistician's favourite sandwich? 
Coronation chicken. <laughs> Two, three, five, seven, eleven, thirteen. All prime examples. <laughs> Division algorithm. Step one, open your eyes. Step two, congratulations, you now have vision. <laughs> Lots of you might remember the bus stop method for long divisions in school. For those of you who can't remember, I'll drop your memory. So what you do, as you take the number you want to divide, oh, I'll do it here to demonstrate. It's a penny. You take the number you want to divide, say, uh, I'm right handed, this is a really bad idea. <laughs> Big number like that, you take the number you want to divide by. And you go to the nearest bus stop and see if any of them know the answer. <laughs> I told you the other day, none of them knew the answer, which really pissed me off. Anyway, I got on the bus. The seat was weird. I thought, hang on, where are we going? Then I realised. I was on the wrong bus. <laughs> Hexagon, said Mario when the curse had finally been lifted. Uh, who's done calculus out of interest? Okay, fair enough. Uh, I was going to write a joke about differentiation, but I was worried it would be too derivative. <laughs> um, now, mathematicians really like differentiation, uh, which, by the way, is just where you find the slope of the curve. Uh, we really like it because we know how to differentiate any function you give us. If you give us a function, mathematicians have the tools to differentiate it. But the opposite of differentiation, integration, is much harder. I'll give you an example. Um, Remember to use the right hand this time. So if you give us a function like sine squared of x, mathematicians know how to integrate that function. However, what mathematicians can't do is integrate into normal society. <laughs> This joke is the mode. <laughs> there you go, you know, like this. So, if, if you still haven't got it, there's not much hope for you. <laughs> uh, I'll give you an indirect hint. I argue that I should go directly in the middle because I'm a stand up cut. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you're all really clever, well done. Um, I'd like to end this evening with. Um, Quite an endearing story that I think proves that mathematicians can be funny. It's about uh, two, two mathematical undergrads at Princeton University in the 70s, David A. Cox and Stephen Zucker. Um, they knew when they met that one day they had to work together on a paper. And sure enough, as postgrads, they delivered on this promise. They came up with um, an algorithm, uh, really obscure stuff in pure maths to do with group theory. But instead, the word algorithm is quite a clunky word. Um, they decided to use the word machine because that's kind of what an algorithm is it's a machine. Um, so I'm delighted to be able to tell you that there's genuinely a thing in maths called the Coxsuck machine. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that makes the world a better, better place. Um, 
Sorry to go off on a tangent. <laughs> And you even threw in some new jokes there. I, I appreciate that. Still, like, we, we, we did do a little bit of rehearsal on Saturday, and that was new stuff. I love it. Just, just can't get enough of these, these maths comedy jokes. Um, right, so we're going to go have a musical act now. So, so next up, we have um, Fred who is going to do a little bit of a performance. Um, and you know what, I'll let Fred tell you, tell you more about it. So, without further ado, welcome Fred. Uh, not, it's not me yet, it's James, no? I was gonna say. <laughs> I told you things would go wrong. <laughs> okay, sorry Fred, Fred will be after James. James! Yeah. It's going to be that. Right, we're going to run a ball again with James. This is a good person. James. Okay. Uh, we've got some sellotape. This is a good start. Uh, is my sellotape down there? Is it in front of you? It would be in here somewhere. Yeah, so I've got some sellotape and we've lost it, which is always good. There we are, my sellotape. Thank you. Right. First thing you need to do is get things in place. Then I can tell you a little book. Right. Oh, we're going this way. Going this way. It's all on camera. <laughs> oh, amazing. Okay, right. I'm going to tell you a little story. So we've already talked about school today, and I'm going to take you right back to school. More specifically, I'm going to take you back to primary school, or my primary school. When I was younger, a lot younger, I know I don't look that old, but when I was a lot younger than I am now, I was sat in your six, I was God in year six, we got to sit on benches, benches at the back. <laughs> and the art teacher, the art teacher came along, and the art teacher said, OK, everybody, I'm going to build something. And the art teacher took a strip of paper. This is a normal strip of paper. And the art teacher took some sellotape. So I'm going to take some sellotape. And the art teacher went, the art teacher was a lot less dyspraxic than I am, <laughs> and she took this and she said, okay, I'm going to form this, and can anybody tell me what I have just formed? What is this? Come on, all you need participation? Yes, a loop. This is a loop, and I'm going to do something to this loop, and I want you to tell me exactly what's going to happen. I'm about to cut this loop lengthways, all the way around. What's going to happen? Two loops. Two loops. Way, good, perfect. So let's do it. I'm going to put the microphone down for a second. Oops. This is going well. So I'm going to cut it all the way around. I've got a loud voice, so I'm all right. So around we go, and yeah. Two loops. <laughs> Don't worry, no problem. Said, okay, I'm going to change one very, very small thing. We're going to take another loop of paper, here's, well, not a loop, but a piece of paper, and I'm going to take some more of my set of sellotape. And I'm going to take sellotape, I'm going to do the same thing. But this time, what I'm going to do is take this edge and I'm going to put a half twist in it. Now, does anybody know what I've just formed? <coughs> Mobius strip. Way, this is called a Mobius strip. Named after, you guessed it, a German mathematician, probably. I haven't done my research. And <laughs> this is a very interesting object. Well, it's a pen. Where's a pen? It's rubber on leaves. I've lost mine. So, what we're going to do is we're going to take this pen and I am going to draw a line. Again, I'm going to put the mushroom down. So, I'm going to have to speak like you. So, here's my pen. Let's draw a line around, and then we need to go a bit further, all around, carry on, and around, and around, and a bit more, and a bit more. We're carrying on going, this, this, this lasts a while, we've got to go around twice, and a bit more, and a bit more. And what you should have just seen is I've drawn a line all over this piece of paper, and that 
is interesting because this has two sides. I can draw a line here, lines are all over, carrying going, and a bit more, and a bit more, and a bit more. And I've got one side that has a line on it, and one side that has not. There we are. And this hasn't happened here. This shape has one side. And the next interesting thing that I can do, and the next thing that art teacher did, was she said, okay, what happens if we do the same thing we did to the loop, but to this? Any you got any suggestions? No, okay, interesting. So, yeah, what happened? I will not get two. I will not get two, you sure? Yes. Good, okay, let's try it. Here's a bigger loop for everyone to see. It's going to take me a while to cut this one. So, there are cut, and we're going to go round. Round, round, round. Oops, rip. There we are. Round and round and round and round and round. And round and round and round and round and round and round and round. And a bit more, and a bit more. This is a long talk, unfortunately. Sorry, Tom. I said this would take me five minutes, but there we are. And I'm going to pull this apart, and we do have one loop. While before we had two loops, now we have one. And has anyone got any idea how many twists this loop has? One. One. Half. Half. Two. Two. Any more? <laughs> Any more guesses? Zero. Zero. Interesting. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Any more guesses? Four. Four, possibly. Can I have Joshua to give me a hand here? So what I'm going to get you to do is hold that. And you can see at the bottom here, I have nothing. Uh, I have no loops and I've lost my scissors, which is amazing. So, ah, thank you. There we are. Scissors. What I'm going to do is stick and I'm going to take twists. So, one, two, three, there's still a twist there, four, come on, behave, there are four, four, four half twists. So, we have, thank you very much, Joshua, round of applause, please. Thank you very much. And we have four half twists. And the interesting thing here is that we went from a half, one half twist with our mobile strip here, and we cut it in half, and we went from one half twist to four. We produced more half twists just by cutting. We didn't twist it anymore, we didn't do anything apart from cutting. So that is the first thing I wanted to show you. The second relies again on a nice big piece of paper, and do you remember how last time I'm going to form another mobile strip? Here's another mobile strip, and I need another bit of tape. And this is, this is something for you to think about. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this and put it round. Come on. There are. So again, I have a mobile strip with a bit of tape. And this is a mobile strip. You can see everyone recognises this at this point. Yep. Yes, good. So, hopefully by the end of, the end of this, this one you'll know what this is and you'll realise what happened. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to cut it about a third of the way down. What do you think is going to happen? Firstly, how many different loops am I going to get? Two. Two. Interesting. Any, any other suggestions? Four, possibly. So, let's give it a cut and let's see what happens. Reminder, I'm doing it a third of the way down. So I'm going to go back here. And I'm going to go cut, cut, cut. This is going to take longer, but I'm going to try and go fast, fast. Just try to cut my fingers off. I am going to practice it, so hopefully you won't need to call an ambulance. So I'm just following my way around, following the left edge, carrying on going, still going, following the left edge, following the left edge, following, 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 following the left edge until I meet. Hopefully I meet at some point. Come on, here we are, come on. And there's more, and there's more, here we are, here's my left edge, and I've, firstly, I've arrived back where I was by cutting around a third, which should not be any of interest to you, but secondly, I have two lips! Woo! This is this I shall let you think about, but thank you very much. Thank you so much, James. Uh, I also had no idea how you got two weeks at the end there. 
Like, actually, you're going to have to teach me the secret of that one later. Yes. Um, right, well, you all know who's next, but we're going to clap him again. So <laughs> please welcome to do a musical number. It's Fred. It's you again, no? No, it's not Tom. It's me. So my name is Fred. Uh, so I am a third year Matthew uh, here at Oxford. Uh, I have spent two years working with Tom, which has been very enjoyable. Um, but other than Matt, uh, I also like to do a lot of music. Um, thank you. Now, in particular, um, I quite like singing. I like singing in harmony. Now, um, if you're even slightly away, you may notice there is one of me, um, but I like singing with myself. So, what I've done for you is I've already recorded um, some audio. Now, I wanted to give you uh, a sort of nice auditory experience, but also some math, this is a math variety show. So what I've done is created a hopefully slightly funny, and hopefully slightly um, enjoyable to listen to, um, parody. Uh, so this is the song Total Eclipse of the Heart, but instead it tells the struggles and perils of a mathematician coming to terms with quite how difficult um, their integral is with which they've been faced. And uh, he eventually realises that what he must do is indeed to integrate by parts. Um, so I'll play it for you now, and I may or may not dramatically recreate some intervals on this board. <laughs> um, and so yeah, here is I integrate by parts. So you, you'll hear four versions of me all singing together, hopefully in tune. Okay, here we go. Functions together, 
For when substitution doesn't work <laughs> And it takes its work Together these two functions make it seem too hard But integrate by pause <laughs> as your trucker As your trucker I don't know what to do so I'll integrate by pause You do me and me do you make math look like art Do you do you do you I really need it tonight Once upon a time, there was light in my life, but now I integrated the dark. <laughs> Nothing left to do, so I integrate my heart. I integrate my heart. So integration by parts, as you can see, there is a method for integrating things. And in particular, when you have two functions multiplied together, as the song suggests, integration by parts is a, it's a very helpful technique. Um, so if you do uh, A-level maths, uh, you will come across integration by parts. Um, and hopefully, when you do come across integration by parts, you will think, ah, I remember that, that weird blonde kid that sung me a song. <laughs> um, he said, when substitution doesn't work, I should integrate my parts. Um, so that's the knowledge that I'll leave you with, which has been hopefully slightly educational. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brad. Um, I don't know about else, I was just... The fact that Fred can reach those, like, all those ranges in his voice is, is truly incredible. Uh, as, as he said, we obviously, ideally, would have had this done live, but unfortunately we have one friend, uh, and he did sing all three parts, which is very, very impressive, so thank you so much. Um, right, now we have another musical number for you. Uh, and of course, you know, there's a strong link between maths and music, uh, and our next former, uh, Michelle, who, bless her, has only just arrived at Oxford, Literally last week, um, I've already roped her in to one of my silly ideas of <laughs> doing this variety show. So please show, you've been showing all the love so far, I've loved it, but especially please show Michelle some extra special love from our audience. Um, so, Michelle, when you're ready, you've got to put your finger on here. Yeah. 
Thanks. Uh, this guy said, uh, I don't want that. This is inequality between notes. So he said, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs>
And so it gives me something like that. But I did have a say I wanted to be a bit more user friendly, so I asked how many of these would you like. So, um, after all that spiel, let's do some composing. So, this is live, basically, and I am going to run the code. Don't worry, I'll do it quite slowly. <laughs> <coughs> so um, this is this is what they say. So can I have a can I have a two forget? Oh, my brain is not switched on. Can I have a two forget number, please? Yeah, so, so, from from the audience. <laughs> Let's have a two forget number then. Seventy three. Seventy three. Okay. Uh, <coughs> and and another two forget number. Uh, young girl there. How many? Twenty four. Yeah, all right. Are you sure? Very good choice. Yeah. 24, okay, okay. So, so now the thing about the ancient Egyptians is, uh, well, they, they were very good at maths, of course, but uh, they didn't like, like doing anything too complicated. Not, not like these guys, you know, more like me. But yeah, sort of. well, well, as you look like Michelle said, you know, they don't know. They don't want to do So, um, you know, two times table, is that all right? Two times table, yeah. Bit of halving, bit of doubling, 
Uh, just stick at that. But anything more, you know, fractions, for example, don't get that. So, um, what's, what's, half of, uh, what's half of 73? Call it that. 36.5. What's 0.5? Half. Ah, don't worry about half. Don't worry about fractions. Uh, what's half of 36? 18. 18, yeah. And, and, oh, is curious? <laughs> uh, yeah, good. Half of 18. Call it out. How many? Nine. Yeah. Half of nine. Four. 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 I don't worry about it. Call it. Uh, half of four. Two. two. Half of two. One. And half of one. Yeah. Oh, no, no. We're into fractions. I think we better stop there. I don't want to make it too tough. It's getting quite late. Today. So there we go. We've done a bit of, um, bit of halving. Easy. Yeah, no, the answer is easy. If I say easy, you go easy. Right, easy? Easy. easy. Very good, right. So we've done some hard, just a bit of doubling. Why not? What's double 24? 48. 48, And uh, it's so nice to have mathematicians in the audience. What's double 48? <laughs> oh, yes, they're going on and wrong here. Right. And double 96? 192. 192. Yeah, they're right. Shout out if, we, if they get it wrong. You know, the mathematician is great. I don't do adding up, I'm a mathematician. Uh, a double 192. Yeah. Well, it would have been a 2, so that would have been a 3, but that would have been an 8 and a, a 4. 384, is that right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, a double that? Oh, yeah. 7, six. <laughs> Goodness knows it's a double <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and, and double that, though. Well, they were set, double seven is fourteen, but that's coming up to six inches. That would have been five. That would have been a two, so a three, and then a six. Is that right? Yeah. Phew, thank you. That's the typical bit. Okay, so we so we've done a bit of halving. We've done a bit of doubling. <coughs> yeah. And uh, easy. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. easy. Yeah. So now the other thing about the ancient Egyptians is they had a bit of a thing about some um, even numbers. Yeah. They were, oh, don't just tell about them, you know, like spiders, you know. So, so, so we wouldn't bother to look at this side, because we'd be doubling, don't we? I mean, that's, that's bound to be all of them even, even if the top one is not even, even, but uh, in this case, all of them even, stuff of nightmares. Don't even look at that, don't, don't, don't bear that. So, uh, <clears throat> so we'll look at this side here. So, at 73, um, it, uh, odd or even? Odd. Oh, that's right, I don't that. At 36, odd or even? Even. Even? Oh, okay. Uh, mm, uh, 18. Uh, oh, really. Even. Uh, uh, nine. Oh. Uh, four. Even. Oh, you get this, you know. uh, and number two. Even. Oh, 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 even. Oh, oh, even. Oh, 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 another even one. And, and this one again. Oh. Oh, there we are. So there we are. So we've done some harming. Don't, don't cross that even one. And uh, oh, what are we left with? Well, on this side, we've got, uh, we've got 24, 192. Two. Colour. 24, 192, and, uh, and 1536. Let's add them up. Why not? Let's add them up. Uh, uh, 4 uh, plus uh, 2 plus 6. What's that? 12. 12. Right? 12. So 2 there. Yeah, the one. Right. <clears throat> 2 and 9 and 3 and 1. Well, 9 and 1 makes 10. That's 12. 15. Yeah. yeah, 15. Can you see that by, at the back? Of the so 15. Whoops. 15. Uh, good. Uh, 1 and 5 and 1 makes 7. Very seven. good. And then what we just got uh, 1 in the thousands column, right? Has anyone got one of these calculator thingies? Anyone got a, anyone got a, a, a phone on their calculator? You're doing the music! You can't do it. <laughs> She's already in the calculator. Who else has got a, who else has got a calculator on you? Can let me have a volunteer with a calculator? Here he is. Come and stand up here. Give him a round of applause. A round of applause. <laughs> Now, um, so Martha, could you please uh, come and stand over here and uh, don't look at the board. Could you please put in 73 mm -hmm. uh, multiplied by 24 and in your biggest, loudest Martha voice, call out the answer one digit at a time. One, seven, five, two. Give a round of applause! And it works every time. Do, do, do you know why it works? Do you want to see why it works? Is there any, hands up if you want, because I could stop if you want. Oh, you want to see it? All right. Okay, I'll show you. Well, I'll show you half of how it works. And the proper mathematicians will tell you how, 
how it really works. But look, um, <clears throat> what do we do here? Well, we had, um, this was obviously one lot of 24. And then, um, then we doubled it, so that would have been two lots of 24, and then four, and eight lots, double, and then 16 lots. So this number must have been 32 lots of 24, and that must have been 64 lots of uh, 24. Uh, but we didn't want 64, we wanted 73 lots. So, we'll start, let's see if we can make 73 out of these numbers. So, 64 plus 32, is that, is that more than 73 or less? More. It's more, so that's, we don't want that. And that 64 plus 16 is 78, it's too much, isn't it? So that, that 64 plus 8? 72. 72, so that's we'll keep that. 72 plus 4, too much. Plus 2, too much. Uh, plus 1? 73. Yeah. So we know 1 plus 8 plus 64 is uh, 73. So 1 lot of 24 plus 8 lots plus 64 lots must be 73 lots. And there you go. What kind of maths is that? Doubling, doubling. It's called what? Egyptian maths. Yeah, give a round of applause. He was listening. Yes. What about, what about this doubling, doubling, doubling? Have you heard of that before? Michelle's heard of it. She was there all the time. What's that? What's that kind of math? Well, we could write this number sideways. So we can make some columns, right? So we can have uh, normally in our in our accounting system we've got columns and they look like this. We've got we've got units. We've got uh, uh, tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, and so on. Or for those of you mathematically inclined, uh, that's uh, ten to the power of uh, one. Uh, that's 10 squared, 10 cubed, 10 to the 4. And these are our columns, and we call this decimals. <coughs> 10 to the power of 0 is, of course, 1. But we've got, uh, we've got different columns. So this is called decimals. In this case, we've got doubling numbers. And the doubling numbers, I might need more columns, we've got 1s and 2s and 4s and 8s and 16s and 32s and 64s. And our number there was actually we needed a 64, an 8, and a 1. So that we would have had one of those, one of those, and one of those. None of them, none of them, none of them, and none of them. Watch this. This is binary. This is, bi this is how Michelle's computer and, and your digital, uh, your, your telephones, uh, digital media, DVDs, all of these uh, electronics these days work by a series of switches. If we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven switches, we have on, off, off, on, on, I'm sorry, on, off, off, on, off, off, on, would be the number 73. So the ancient Egyptians were actually, and I love this, they were doing this, the maths in the same way that our computers televisions and digital broadcasts, all the modern electrons we use today, they were using the same principles, principles of binary. Isn't that lovely? Hey, you round of applause for ancient Egyptians. <laughs> and that's good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, David. I love the records to DVDs. Well, for the older members. Well, they don't exist. <laughs> Uh, once again, David is available for her. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, so, before I introduce our, our final act of the evening, um, to close the show with a bit of a barrier, a bit of a rock and roll, um, some of you may have noticed I've casually been having less and less clothes on. <laughs> I hope some of you noticed that wasn't purpose, because um, I was planning to talk to you all a little bit about my tattoos, but then I didn't want to take any of the limelight away from these fantastic who are a lot of them getting to perform for the first time. You know, I'm used to, I, I'm very fortunate that I get to perform a lot more, so I didn't want to steal any of your, of your thunder. Um, but I will just take this opportunity to mention one or two, because I did promise I'd talk a little bit about my maths tattoos in, in the, uh, the brief for the event, if anyone read that. Um, so I've got a couple of new additions. I've got a, one up here on my shoulder, which is Maxwell's Equations of Electromagnetism. Uh, which I, I, I really like. Um, so the, the sort of it looks very complicated, but my, my favourite thing about this is a guy called Maxwell, 
uh, did some experiments and figured out what was going on with electricity and magnetism and the fact that you can take one, you can take electricity and you can create a magnetic field and you can take a magnetic field and use it to create electricity. And he sort of wrote down these equations that were following the results of the experiment. And then beyond that, it then sort of, the mathematicians came up and said, well, if I take these equations and um, we do some maths to them, both the equations for electricity and the equations for magnetism turn into what we call in maths the wave equation. So the mathematicians were like, well, that kind of means that electricity is a wave and also that magnetism is a wave. So like, what's going on? Um, and, you know, they mentioned this to the physicists, and then the physicists thought, nah, like, like, light, you know, the EM spectrum, that's not possibly a wave. But the mathematicians, because they showed that it satisfied the wave equation, were adamant, no, like, try this. So then some very, very clever physicists did, they went, they did some experiments, and they showed that light can behave as a wave. So it's the physicists who actually showed this, but I love the fact that it was the mathematicians who first thought maybe it would be possible to check this just by playing around with the equations. So that's what's sort of represented on the, on the tattoo on the shelf. So, our final act of the evening. Um, so, he, as I said, he's going to come up and sing two songs for you, uh, written all by himself, um, and he's going to sing them, play his electric guitar, so please give a huge round of applause to Sadiq.
I think that is about as much as I'm going to say. <coughs> Let us begin. <laughs> I'm just going to have a comment from the audience. I love the amount of explanation required <laughs> to, to then perform the song. You know you're at a mass variety show and you have a three minute explanation of several graphs being drawn and some integration being done before you get to hear the actual song. <laughs>
to me, which gets really confusing sometimes. And I have no idea what's going on. But then I remember, I'm a mathematician, and I know exactly what's going on. I'm in a love triangle. I wish polygons existed there only had two sides, it's not viable. Between two points in the clear in space, you can only draw one line. I'm in a love isosceles, and this is quite possibly the worst I've ever felt. There's something wrong with me. I wish polygons existed there only had two sides. Well, hold on just one second, maybe they do. Just make a zero angle between me and you. We have overlapping edges in our unusual polygon. And if you disappear from what you hear, I can draw the side of three arcs on a sphere. So the edges are distinct, and now it's clear what's going on. I'm in a love triangle. Totally in love, and there's no one else in sight. It's so magical. No polygons exist that only have two sides. I'm in a love diagram. Nobody else to rely on. It's just you and me in our atmosphere. We're just two corners on a happy sphere with two big sides between. If I am into shape, then doesn't that mean that from the very start I could have been not to the one? A single vertex on a sphere all alone, a single edge that runs from me to my own. I think this is the loneliest shape ever known to anyone. I'm in a love monogram. No, there's nobody on this earth in love with me. What's going on? This could never have existed in your collegian 2D. A love monogonal dihedron. Nobody to lean on, cause it's only me and this sad town. That's cut in two by a sad frown running in between. But hold on just a second, just one more time If I were to continue on this downward climb Remove the last vertex, could there be a zero gone? No vertices with no edges in between Now what the hell is fair, does that even mean? I think that I was better off just being stuck with standard definitions of the shape Indeed, bring us to the end of what I'm going to claim is the first ever Matt Morrissey show. <laughs> uh, so, a huge thank you once again to, to all of our performers, uh, to all of you for turning out um, and sort of welcoming back live events. Uh, sorry we overran a little bit. Um, we will be sticking around if anyone really wants to come chat to us, we're very welcome to do so. Um, and also, if you do want to hear Michelle's music, is it ready to go, Michelle? Okay, so if you want to hear Michelle's music, stick around for that, but also this is officially the end, so if you need to leave and everything else, please, please feel free to do so. But can we just have one final huge 
round of applause for all of our fantastic acts. It's really good.